Shalom, everyone. I'm Monty Judah with Lion and Lamb Ministries, and welcome to our Torah study. We are in the midst of the book of Leviticus, and I know a lot of people, when they first hear about that, they don't think it's going to be all that interesting to them, to it, but I'm going to try to do my best to, again, f fulfill the theme of the Torah is for all people, and there are things here in the book of Leviticus that you need to know and are about your life, about your faith in Messiah Yeshua. So with that introduction, let me take you to Leviticus uh, chapter 6, and we are going to begin at verse 8. And this Torah portion is uh, pronounced Zav, uh, Tzav, is Tzav, I think is a better way to say it. And it's the word command. And in verse 7, the first word there says, Command Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. Um, uh, I, there's something else in the scripture that I need to point out to you. In a Jewish Bible, this verse here at verse 8 is actually verse 1 of chapter uh, 6. That they take the, the first verses of chapter 6, the first seven verses, and they are attached to the previous chapter 5. Now, you and I, we look and we start seeing chapter 6, verse 1, and you'll know, it, and it's added, to, um, it's added to the previous portion. Now, I, I want to make mention of that because in the last Torah portion, one of the things I told you about was if a person does intentional sin against another person, then according to the law, when he brings a sacrifice, he has to make restitution to the person and then add one fifth. Where, where did I really get that from? It's actually in the in the Hebrew Bible. That's part of last week's portion, but here, uh, and I don't want to skip it. I want to make sure that we fully understand this in chapter six that I had covered. In fact, let me read for you from chapter six, beginning of verse one, those first seven verses, and you'll discover it's what I was talking about last week. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, When a person sins and acts unfaithfully against the Lord and deceives his companion in regard to a deposit or a security entrusted to him, or through robbery, or if he has extorted from his companion, or he's found what was lost and lied about it and sworn falsely so that he, has sin he sins in regard to anyone of the things a man may do, then it shall be when he sins and becomes guilty that he shall restore what he took by robbery or what he got by uh, extortion or the deposit which was entrusted to him or the lost thing which he found or anything about which he swore falsely. He shall make restitution for it in full and add to it one-fifth more. He shall give it to the one to whom it belongs on the day he presents his guilt offering. Last week I shared with you, the Lord says, don't bring your offering to the altar. You need to first give it to the person you wronged before you come and ask for present alms for, for um, intentional sin against another person. Then he shall bring to the priest his guilt offering to the Lord, a ram without defect from the flock, according to your valuation for guilt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord, and he shall be forgiven for any one of the things which he may have done to incur guilt. Again, that's in, in the first portion, that's the only mention of what we call intentional sin. If someone steals from another person, and there's a variety of ways you can steal. A deposit could have been put with you and you don't pay it back. You don't give him his deposit back. You just take it. Or if you rob him, or you find something, and you discover who it belongs to and you don't return it, things of that nature, that's where you have sinned against another person. And the Lord says if you do that, you have to bring a guilt offering and you must make restitution to the person first, plus one-fifth. And as I shared with you last week, that one-fifth is really 25% of the way we calculate things. So say the valuation is 100 one-fifth is actually 25, which normally you would be thinking is a quarter, but it's 
one-fifth when you put together as a whole. So 125, which is the whole, 25 is one-fifth of the whole uh, for that. I know it's a little bit of a tricky math, but that's the way the Lord specified it was to be done for it. And I just wanted to mention that before we got into this next portion of command. The word tasav is a very interesting word. If you break it down um, to um, um, the, the meaning of the letters, the, in other words, the deep derivation of the word, it means that it's like a nail or an attaching part. The thing that attaches you to God and the way God attaches to you is by you following his commands. If you want to really draw near to the Lord, do what the Lord says. That's how you draw near to him. If you don't do what he says, you're not going to draw near to him. You're not going to be attached to him. As you begin to learn the commandments of the Lord and begin to keep them, the more you keep them, the more you become attached to the Lord. It's not he's there and you're here. It's more about you are together with him. And so there's a word picture there that commands are what attaches us to the Lord. And he goes on now, and, and again, this portion is going to repeat in sequence some of the same content we saw in the first portion for Leviticus. Um, we're going to talk about uh, whole burnt offerings, grain offerings, guilt offerings, sin offerings, and so forth. Only the phraseology that's used this time, it is this is the law of that particular offering, meaning that this is the instruction to the priest as to how this offering will be presented. They are under commandment to offer the particular way. The first portion was, was uh, addressing to a person who brings an offering. In other words, they, God wants you to understand what's going to be happening when you bring an offering to him as to what, how it will be handled and conducted and so forth. But this is the portion now that tells the priest when, you br when, they, br when they bring this offering, this is what you definitely will do. And so they call it the law of the various offerings. Before... Um, uh, before we get to going here too much, I've got to show you something that is in this uh, verse, um, verse uh, 9, where it says, Command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law for the whole burnt offering. The burnt offering itself shall remain on the hearth, on the altar, all night until morning, and the fire on the altar is to be kept burning on it. There's several things I need to explain about this verse. You see the word hearth? There, if you go into the Hebrew and you look in a Hebrew text, you look in a um, Sefer Torah scroll, you're going to notice something rather interesting because at the word hearth, uh, there's the Hebrew letter mem is in that word. And they make the letter mem small, like in Vayikra, the olive was made small in that word. The scribes make the letter mem that is, uh, is in this word for hearth. Um, and I believe that the pronunciation of the Hebrew word there is mekada for the hearth of it, meaning where the fire part is at of the altar. And the, the mem is the first letter of that word, and that letter is made intentionally small by the scribes. Here is the logic and the rationale behind that. And here's the lesson that is supposed to be taught. A mem, the letter mem, has the, the actual um, symbology is, is what's well called chaotic waters. And chaotic waters, the, the most shining example of chaotic waters, is when a woman's womb, when she breaks water, when she breaks water and the ambionic fluid flows out, where it's just baby and her now uh, coming out of the womb, and it's a sign that birth is about to take place. Birth is imminent when you break water. Um, and there's chaos in the house. You know, if a woman is pregnant and, and so forth, and all of a sudden it's announced in the house that she just broke water. Chaos, 
comes into the house. We're going to have a birth. I mean, this is the first priority. Stop everything else you're doing here. We, we got to do this. Um, and that's part of the meaning for it, for what it is. But the letter mem, uh, with that meaning, is supposed to be the shape of a womb. It looks like a kind of a soft, triangle, round thing. It's got a little bulbous, bulbous thing around it. You know, and it's supposed to be the kind of a higher glyph of a womb. And the soul of a person enters into his body in the womb. God says, I knew you when you were in the womb, and I formed your parts, and I put a soul into you. And then when you came out and you took your first breath, you became a living soul. But you were a soul in there. You were a person in there. I knew you by name. Jeremiah, this is one of the things the Lord said to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, I knew who you were when you were still in the womb of your mother. By the way, you can imagine that this uh, religious thinking and the so forth carries great weight on the subject of abortion. When is a person a person? And part of what the court in dealing with the subject of abortion, particularly in our country, has not honestly dealt with the subject of when is a person a person because every person is protected under the law in the Constitution. Well, if you call a fetus, an embryonic child, is a soul, it's a person there, separate from the mother, and oh, by the way, his system, that child's system through the umbilical cord, is completely separate from the mother's system completely separate tissue and so forth. Um, well, and if that's a person and they're protected by the Constitution, then there's should the destroying that life is murder. Now, some are saying, no, 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 they don't become a, a, a person until after they're physically born. But as you know, the abortionists in our country now have gotten to the point, if you take the baby out of the womb and it's still alive, breathing, a living soul, if you just leave it still and let it die on its own, then that's an acceptable abortion technique, too. That's negligence, and homicide is what that is, according to the Bible. So that's the reason why a lot of conservative and religious people are very opposed to, to abortion. I um, want to talk about something that's relevant out of Leviticus for us today, that maybe the Torah definitions and Torah is applicable to all people today. You can take the subject of abortion right now, and I guarantee you that this is the text that says abortion is murder. This is the portion. And any person who, and because I wish my Christian brother, who were anti-abortionists, would find out what God's definition is for a person and use the scriptural basis for it. And in, in fact, it's in the words, this is the law of God. And to assert to our congressmen, our legislature, to get the law straight for our country. Because right now, abortion is contrary to the laws of God. And we as believers of the Lord, even though we're trying to follow the Torah, we're complicit with the country and the people that we're in. We, we, the blood's on our hands just as well. Our country has chosen to do this. We will collectively suffer the penalty of defying God's laws. And maybe that's the reason why um, we're not seeing too many blessings from the Lord lately, and it seems like his judgments are falling upon us as a country for it. And we certainly have earned this one. I mean, if he were just to take this one issue... Our country is worthy of being Sodom and Gomorrah just on this one alone, just on the sheer slaughter of other persons. I also personally believe that these persons who have died at the hand of all of us, they're going to make it into the kingdom. Um, now, I realize this is speculation on my part, but I'll, let me explain. You know, the scripture says that when we get to the kingdom, it says we will rule and reign with the Messiah. So the question is, who are we going to rule and reign over? I believe that we'll rule and reign over children. 
Children that suffered death or in their life could never have the opportunity to choose the Lord. Aborted children. And there's going to be a whole lot of them in the kingdom. And we will be ruling and reign with the Messiah over them, teaching them and training them about the Lord. Now, they didn't get into the kingdom the same way we did. We got in by the, by the sacrifice of Yeshua. They got there because they're innocent. And obviously, in the, in the, um, they're going to have to be tested. And they'll have to make their decision for eternity. And maybe that's the reason why at the end of the thousand years, Satan is released and permitted to go and attempt to deceive the nations, meaning all the peoples. And maybe the people he's attempting to deceive are all of those that were raised and grew up in the millennial kingdom. See if they will choose the Lord or choose him. I don't know. That's speculation on my part. But I do, but my, my heart instinct, the God that I believe in, the God that loves me and has shown great comfort and care for me, I know God stands for the innocent. And he does, and, and vengeance is his, and I believe that, that um, uh, he, he will do what is necessary to make this whole subject just and right uh, in the end. In the meantime, we have to just wait for those days and until the Lord prepares to do it. So uh, this mem, which means a, a womb where a soul comes together, what this commandment is actually doing says... When you make a whole burnt offering, it shall remain on the hearth of the altar all night until morning, <clears throat> and the fire on the altar is to be kept burning. So a man comes in with his whole burnt offering. He puts the burden on the offering of his life, lays his hands on it. The sacrifice is slain. It's prepared. It's put up on the altar. Essentially what is being said here is, he is supposed to put his soul up on the altar. That by taking that substitute sacrifice, when that's put up there, that's taking his soul and putting it up on the altar. That's what it's actually saying. He's to put his soul on the altar. It's, I don't just come in and give God a bowl, say, hey, enjoy the barbecue, and walk home. No, I go up there and this is, this is me before the Lord. And when it says it's to be kept on there and completely consumed all through the night, that means that during that period of time, he is supposed to be before the Lord, putting his soul before the Lord. This isn't just he comes in quickly and does this. This means that for until the next day, he is putting his soul before the Lord. Um, and he's dedicating that time for the purpose. Now, this is an excellent example of when I say that the Torah is for all people, even for today. I want to take you to the book of Romans, and I'll show you something that Paul taught us in Romans chapter 12. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this passage of Scripture. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says the following. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul is teaching the small mem of Leviticus chapter 6. Because he's referring to, when you come before the altar, the mercies of God. The phrase, by the mercies of God, means that you're coming under the sacrificial system to, pre to present sacrifices at God's altar. All of the uh, sacrifices that the law specifies, are referred to as one of the mercies of God. So when we refer to the mercies of God, we're talking about all of the sacrifices that come to the, to, to the uh, altar and to the temple. And he says, when you come by the mercies of God to present your bodies, and he's including not only your soul, but your whole person, 
He's saying, what he's really trying to say is, put your whole person up on the altar. Make it a living, holy sacrifice, acceptable to God. Get your heart in the right place. Get your soul in the right place. Get your will in the right place. Get all that you are, get it right with God, which is your spiritual service of worship. You want to really worship the Lord? Go put your whole body, soul, and mind before the Lord. That's, that's real worship, you know, before the Lord. I, you know, I have lots of friends, who, and, and especially those that are in charge with music. The one thing I would remind, music is supposed to be just setting the mood so that the worshiper is putting their soul before the Lord. Let the words of the music stimulate you to put your soul before him. Put your mind before him. You know, commit your will to him. That is your spiritual service of worship. And you specifically do it by not being conformed to the world. You turn away from the world, turn only to the Lord. And then you're allowing yourself to be transformed by the Spirit of God. The renewing of your mind. And with the renewing of the mind, you now see things through God's eyes. You see things the way he sees things. You see what is the will of God. You see what is good. You see what is acceptable. You see what is perfect. You see the things he says. And part of coming to worship the Lord is to draw us to, um, to understanding what is God's will, to submit ourselves to it. I will tell you personally, um, from my own, I'm not a very good singer. I'm not musically inclined. Um, I'm the only guy in my congregation, I've shared this before, I'm the only guy in my congregation that I picked up a tambourine one time in a service and decided to bang the tambourine with everybody. They actually came over and took the tambourine away from me uh, because I have a rhythm deficiency. I, I cannot clap synchronously with an audience. Forget it. I, I don't know what it is. I, I hear harmony and music, and all I am is confused. I'll add one other thing. When I hear music, you know, singing music, I, I can't discern the words. When it gets into a melody, it's very difficult for me to say, what, what word did they say? I, I just, I don't have that ability. Uh, uh, that's the reason I never got into pop music. You know, as a young man, a kid, and what I couldn't understand anything about what they were singing about. I have no idea what those songs are about. I just hear the rhythm and the backbeat and the uh, melody and the flow of the music. But <laughs> what did they say? Heck, I don't know. I have no idea. I can't even repeat it back. Uh, Enya, one of, the, one of the ladies that sings really melodic, beautiful songs. I have no idea what that woman is singing about. None whatsoever. I couldn't pronounce, couldn't repeat anything she said whatsoever. I don't have that ability, but I will tell you this. If I'm in a spiritual service and I hear worship music before I get up to teach, I am supercharged when I stand up to teach. I mean, I can feel the Spirit of the Lord on me tremendously if I have heard music before I get up to teach, worship music, and heard other people worshiping. I don't, I don't know if I can extract a principle out of that for you all, but I, that's my personal experience, to where that I do value worship music, but not quite for the same reasons that a lot of other people do. To me, it's, it's I feel a drawing to the Lord um, with the sound of the music, even though I don't know what the words say. And, and so I literally have to have the words in front of me. And the moment I start reading the words, I forget the music. I can either think about the music or I can think about the words, but I can't do both of them at the same time uh, for it. All right. So much for me and my personal testimony. Uh, I want you to also take note of this expression in verse uh, 9. And the fire on the altar is to be kept burning on it. This was a requirement of the priests. The duties of the priest was that when you, that sacrifice goes up on the altar, particularly the evening sacrifice or any whole burnt sacrifice, it is to continue, the fire is to continue at all times. 
And the custom that was in the temple worked something like this. Uh, when the temple final evening sacrifice was put on, there's no more sacrifices being prepared and put on the altar. They would begin to shut down the temple for the day. And the priesthood would go home, you know, to their homes, wherever they were staying. And they would station a priest who had the duty for that night to stay in the temple. And his job was to keep the fire on the altar tended and taken care of. He was to make sure that the fire on the hearth remains, that it will completely consume during the course of that night, the evening sacrifice or any whole burnt offerings, so that they're rendered to pure ash come the next morning. And he's to make sure the fire is still going um, on the altar. Now, the custom was that the how the altar or the temple was opened in the morning was the high priest and the others that were going to serve the duty with him, they would come to the temple just before the dawn. It was still dark. Dawn hadn't opened up yet. And it's still dark. And he would come, and the expression was, he would come like a thief in the night. And by the way, whether you realize or not, thieves, if they're going to come and burglarize your house, you know what time it is that they predominantly come? They come sometime after 3 o'clock in the morning before 5 o'clock in the morning, before the dawn of the day. Uh, making sure that you fell asleep and that you were asleep before they want to burglarize your house. And so the expression, he comes like a thief in the night, he comes in the very, very early morning. And so the priest would go in there and he would go into the temple and the first thing that he would do, the high priest would go and check the fire on the altar. Is there a, is there a fire on the hearth? Has, has the evening sacrifice been completely consumed and so forth? Well, you can imagine what could have happened during the night. This one priest has been stationed there to keep an eye on it. Um, and let's say he got a little bit tired, and so he sat down there somewhere in the temple, and he fell asleep. And he's snoozing away and not keeping an eye on the altar, and the fire burns down, but it doesn't quite consume all of it. You've seen campfires where not all of the logs burn and not all the stuff that was there burned. And so the, the fire died down to where it's just coals and, and ashes, but it hasn't consumed everything that's there. And um, when the priest would see that, he was the one who would then, the high priest, he was the one that was authorized to stoke the fire, get more wood into it, and get it going again. And he would get that going. Then he would take his fire pan, and he would scoop up some of the coals that came from the fire the night before, and he would go looking for the sleeping priest. He would find him in the temple, and he would take these coals and put them to the bottom garments, bottom of the garments, the priestly garments. Um, and these garments would then catch on fire. Now, the priest, the sleeping priest, would wake up because his outfit is on fire. And as you can imagine, he would get up and he'd be dancing all around trying to figure out how to get the fire out. And generally, the only way he could save himself was he had to tear his garments off him. He had to literally take them off of him. And by the way, let me go ahead and just mention to you that these priestly garments were not uh, OSHA-approved fire-retardant garments. These things would burn in a hurry. Uh, in fact, old priestly garments, garments that had been soiled by doing the, the slaughter and the butcher work of, um, the, that the priests would do, these garments were shredded and they would make the wicks that would go in the lamp in the menorah. So these would burn like a wick. Now, when you see a wick of a camera, that will, uh, of a candle, that will burn very easily. And so that's the whole priestly garment is made out of that material, like the wick for a candle. And um, the, uh, uh, they would uh, uh, catch on fire and burn up in your upper thing, and you'd have to tear it off. Five times we hear in the New Testament that the Lord makes reference to his return, the second coming, as a thief coming in the night. 
and he's making reference to what the high priest would do when he would come back to it. So let me take the proposition a little bit further with you. You know that the Messiah came and he created a temple inside of us. Well, did you know that there's an altar in that temple? An altar that is, has the evening and morning sacrifice before the Lord, perpetual fire before the Lord, and the priest's duty is to keep the fire on that altar going. But some of us like to fall asleep on the Lord, and we don't pay too close attention to what's going on with that temple that's inside of us. And the Lord warns us, he says, look, when I come back, I'm going to be just like that priest who comes in early in the morning. And if there's no fire on that altar that's supposed to be, I'm going to light one. I'm going to light you up as well. And so the exhortation that is given in the book of Revelation chapter 16 at the conclusion of the plagues, the final judgments of the book of Revelation, it says, Blessed is he who remains awake and keeps his garments. And it's a reference to this very instruction. The book of Revelation is actually making reference to the law of the burnt offering and how the altar is to be maintained in talking about the second coming of the Messiah back to us. Um, you need to find out about what the temple had in it, how things were done in it, because that's what's going on inside of you. And if you ignore these things and don't understand these things, you don't understand spiritually what's happening inside of you. And when the Messiah shows up, if things are not in proper order, he's going to put them in proper order. But if he has to light that altar for you again, you are not going to like the results. This will be part of your giving an account to the Lord. The faithful priest who keeps the fire on the altar is going to be hearing the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, that you were attentive to the things I told you to be, and you maintained and did the things. And it has to do a lot with the Lord saying, don't forget me. Don't forget me. In the military, I can tell you, and every military veteran knows this, there are two things that you don't want to do. The second one is the worst one. The first is don't go AWOL. Don't be absent without leave. You know, missing. You know, don't, don't do that. Guarantee you're going to get to see the captain. You're going to get to see the commander over that deal. You're going to pay a price. Okay? The second one is don't fall asleep on watch. You fall asleep on watch, you'll get no mercy out of a commander. You won't get mercy from your fellow soldiers or sailors because you're supposed to be there to protect the rest of us. It's one thing for you to be missing and not be able to make the ship's movement. It's a whole other thing that you were there and you didn't do your duty when you were on duty and you endangered us all. And there is no mercy, you know. I, I know of guys that now when I was in the military, that if I found out he had fallen asleep on watch, he, he just never was going to re be restored in my thinking or the thinking of my shipmates on how we treat him. He's regarded as he's, he's a goof off and he's dangerous and uh, you can't count on him for it. Don't fall asleep on watch. And by the way, I think that same... Stigma was associated with the priests. If they fell asleep on watch, I'm not sure they were ever entrusted with other important duties. It was a major test to the faithfulness of a priest in the temple system was to keep that fire on the altar. Uh, it's, there's a whole bunch that comes out of this uh, that, that drove temple custom and tradition where this command was simply given and then Aaron and his sons came up with the necessary procedures and the necessary customs to maintain what the Lord had commanded them to do. And that's essentially what a lot of people don't understand about the whole temple service. Aaron and his sons were charged with the responsibility of these laws to institute the Torah customs and procedures to organize the priesthood in such a way to ensure that all of these things were taken care of. And that's the reason why in the temple service, certain priests specialized 
almost like medical people. They were the ones who could examine you for if you had a skin condition and so forth that the laws required. They were the ones who could examine animals. They were the ones who understood uh, grains and foodstuffs. And we had, we had certain priests that dedicated themselves as bakers. They baked the showbread and, and, and so forth. And by the way, one of the meal offerings that's brought can not only be fine flour, but can be toasted into wafers and can be unleavened bread. Only unleavened bread. Uh, was to be put there, um, and so forth. The except for there was some leavened bread. I I have to correct myself, but it wasn't. It had to be done in a very special way, to, and so the priesthood was organized to do that. There were certain priests that became experts as butchers of the animals. Certain experts had great skill in dealing with bulls as opposed to other smaller creatures. There were certain priests that uh, became involved with overseeing the finances of the temple. There were certain priests that became uh, the captains of the guard and uh, how to defend the, the temple proper and so forth. There was a host of different jobs. And they set up these divisions uh, to where that um, every priest had a minimum of two weeks a month that he served in the temple. He lived back in his community, but two weeks out of the, out of, excuse, two weeks out of the year that he had to serve, and then he had to serve at all the high holidays. He would come to Jerusalem for the high holidays, serve as a part of that, but then he would have the duty for two weeks in other uh, times of the year. The reason why we take note of that is they were broken up into divisions in the time of King David, and they named the divisions of them. And if you recall, the father of John the Baptist was one of those priests, and we know John the Baptist was born six months before Yeshua was born. And that's how we know that Yeshua was born in the fall, is because um, when Mary visited Elizabeth, uh, that was six months before we know went to him when he, when he served. And that's part of the, once you understand the temple system, it tells you a lot about what was going on. Um, in the world and how, and it gives you context on how all of this was taken care of and so forth. The, um, if, as we go back down here again, you're going to see some other specific things um, that we'll learn from it. Altar dedication. We need to mention that because that's going to have a bearing on us in the future. In the altar dedication, the first one that was done, and by the way, at this point, some of the instruction is coming in how to set up and ordain the tabernacle, ordain the altar, ordain the priest. It's in this portion. And one of the things about uh, dedicating and ordaining the altar was that it was a seven-day procedure. And when they dedicated the altar uh, the first time, the for seven days... They sacrificed one bull and one goat. And then on the eighth day, they sacrificed for the first time the daily sacrifice, the morning lambs and the evening lambs. And from then on out, the altar was ordained, and they would do the morning lamb. Then you bring other sacrifices during the middle of the day, and the last sacrifice to go on was the evening lamb. So it was kind of like a set of bookends. Morning lambs, evening lambs, all the other sacrifices in between. But to get to that position, you had to have you had to dedicate the altar first by bloods and bulls and goats. Um, when the prophecy talks about the abomination of desolation at the end of the ages, it's referring specifically to the abomination of desolation as the cessation or the stopping of the morning and the evening lambs. In other words, there has to be an ordained altar. There has to have been a procedure where bulls and goats had been sacrificed first, and then on the eighth day, the morning, or morning and evening lambs were offered, which is called the tamid offering, the daily offering. And those were the rules for the altar. The priests were commanded that the altar is to be maintained in this way that it has to be dedicated, you must maintain the daily sacrifice, it has to be done every day, and the fire has to be kept going at night. It, it, that, that's the way he specified how it was to be done. Those are the commandments to the um, priests for it. 
And as we go down through this portion, we see a little bit more about additional instructions for different types of offerings, for guilt offerings, meal offerings, peace offerings. And it gets down into the level of detail of, for example, what portion of the sacrifice belongs to the priests and what portion is offered to the Lord and what portion would be coming back to the offer so that he could go and have his personal feast with his family. And then it comes down to some very, very specific details about what was to be done with the fat and the blood of sacrifices. And it emphatically is given that no one was to eat any of the blood of any sacrifice or any animal. And this is the basis for what will be driving the, the commandments for kosher, for foods. In fact, in Leviticus 11 is what we call the kosher Passover. In other words, he, Moses specifies the list of what will be considered clean versus unclean. And the, um, in the course of this, um, he begin, begins to specify what you're permitted to consume versus what you're not permitted to consume. The fat belongs to the Lord. The blood is to be returned to the earth. Um, and you're not to eat the blood and uh, so forth for it. Um, there's a little bit more here I want you to take note of as we... Um, uh, get into this. The stage is going to be set uh, for the next week's portion, particularly about it's the portion we call Shemini on the eighth day. And um, on Shemini, on the eighth day of the original ordination of the, of the uh, tabernacle and the altar, that was when God brought fire down to the altar. It was on the eighth day. The number eight is a very significant number throughout Scripture. It carries a very powerful theme. It means new beginnings. Everywhere where you see the number eight, you're gonna, you can carry the theme of new beginnings, and it will make sense into the context of what is being taught at that point. The eighth day of the altar is the new beginnings. The eighth day of the week, a new week. Okay, So the number eight was always about new things. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting because the gematria for the name Yeshua, you probably don't hear this very often, it's 888, 888. The Messiah is new beginnings for us. Uh, he's the one that gives us a new life, new creation. You know, from, so even the, the gematria of his name you know, carries the same theme of eight. Um, the, uh, so what else it is that I wanted to specifically mention here? Um, in the talking about <clears throat> uh, the, the, the seven-day ordination, it will also include the ordination of the priesthood too. The priesthood was ordained at the exact same time. Aaron and his, his sons were ordained at exactly the same time. The first altar was ordained. They are linked. They cannot be separated. Priests have to do with the work of the altar, the table of God. And the Messiah, who is our great high priest, he is linked to the table of God for us to be reconciled to him. And as I shared with you in previous portions, um, you must have, According to the law, you must have, there's God, there must be an intercessor or a priest, and then there's you. And you cannot approach God directly. You must go through an intercessor. You cannot make any offering to the Lord directly. You must have a priest that is involved. So when Yeshua said that he was the intercessor, no one comes to the Father but by me. He's referring to the requirements Leviticus and Torah, this is how you come before God. This is the only way. That was not a, a new, you didn't see the religious Jews get all upset about that, did you? When he made that statement. No, they understood. You can't go before God without a priest. You can't do it. You can't make any gift to the Lord 
without being certified by a priest and the, and the priest assisting you in presenting it to the Lord. That's the way it works uh, for it. When I hear, um, uh, I don't want to get too far on my bandwagon here. When I hear people taking the book of Hebrews and saying, well, the Levitical priesthood is obsolete, it's been done away with, and they, most Christians then diminish the rationale that God made here for an advocate, for an intercessor. Since we're going to try to make the Levitical priesthood go away, the book of Hebrews suggests, um, and by the way, I think the book of Hebrews was written by some well-meaning Gentile who had not been taught to her and didn't know these principles. And that's the reason why he made a huge mistake on this, unbelievable mistake on this. And it's misled the entire Christian world to follow the book of Hebrews and this teaching uh, to think these kinds of things. As a Torah teacher, I want to encourage you that you need to get back to the original instruction of Moses and the Messiah, and you need to understand when he said, no man comes to the Father but by me, it's based on the principles of priesthood. It's based on the principles of how God sets his table. You want to be reconciled to me? You want to get atonement from me? This is the way you will do it. You will not do it the way you want. You will come and you will work with my intercessor and my advocate. I took the entire tribe of Levi, specifically Aaron and his sons, and I established them for this service and for this purpose. I would also remind you, all, especially all of my Christian brethren, when we get to the Millennial Kingdom, the Levitical priesthood will be fully operational. There will be an altar, there will be a temple, and the and the sons of Aaron will be serving. And Leviticus, excuse me, Jeremiah 33, verse 17 and 18, emphatically says, there will be no want for a man to rule on the throne of God, meaning from the sons of David, and the Messiah is the son of David, and there will be no want for a Levitical priest not to be there serving continually before the Lord forever. Um, that's pretty emphatic. By the way, the writer of Hebrews didn't have that verse uh, because in the Septuagint that he was writing in, the second half of Jeremiah 33 is not in the Greek Septuagint. It was knocked out and wasn't included. So if he only had that as his reference text, he was misled uh, by the absence of Jeremiah 33, verse 17 and 18. And so uh, we have the whole of the scripture with all those errors have been corrected. And now we need to understand that our conclusions need to be lining up with the instruction that God gave us through the book of Leviticus, what the prophets have said, what the Messiah taught. That is the proper way for us to interpret these instructions, not to delete any one of those or not diminish any one of those. The conclusion needs to contain all of them together. The instruction from Leviticus, the instruction from the prophets, the instruction from the Messiah. And by the way, the apostles didn't take issue with these things. It's churchmen who have taken an issue with these things. And we as believers today in Yeshua, and those of us that are turning back to the Torah, we need to be careful and mindful <coughs> to correct this incredible error of our previous instruction. <clears throat> Pardon me. All right, that is our lesson for this Sabbath. This evening, at the conclusion of Sabbath, is the beginning of the Seder for Passover. I want to wish all of you a very happy Passover as you begin to eat of the unleavened bread for the Feast of Unleavened. Shalom. Shabbat shalom to all of you. Thank you for joining us. This broadcast has been made possible by the Lord and by the generous donations of brethren like you. If you would like to give a donation to help keep this broadcast on the air, please visit llgive.com. Thank you.